Zaczynamy drugą sekcję nowożytną. Nazywam się Anna Michałowska-Mycielska i będę miała przyjemność prowadzić tę sekcję. Pierwszym referentem będzie pan profesor Moshe Rosman z Uniwersytetu Barilan w Izraelu. Moshe Rosman specjalizuje się w historii Żydów polskich w okresie wczesnonowożytnym. Swoje książki poświęcił Żydom w majątkach magnackich. Również pisał o początkach hasydyzmu polskiego. Dzisiejszy, dzisiejszy referat zatytułowany jest Historiografia dotycząca Żydów polskich 1970-2015. Konstrukcja, konsensus, kontrowersje. Bardzo proszę. Thank you very much. Yesterday Barbara stated that the museum was guided by the historiography of the last generation. And it's that historiography that I'd like to try to characterize now. Beginning around 1970, a new infrastructure for the study of Polish Jewish history gradually came into being. <laughs> The new Encyclopedia Judaica appeared in 1972 with many articles on subjects related to the history of the Jews in Poland. Yad Vashem began publishing its Encyclopedia of Jewish Communities, Pinkasa Kihilot. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, there was a flurry of reprints or translations of some classic works of historiography which were of great importance for this subject such as Israel Sindberg's History of Jewish Literature and Shimon Dubnov's History of the Jews in Russia and Poland. In addition, key primary sources were also reprinted or translated. For example, the memoirs of Bera Bolochov appeared in both Hebrew and English. The 1595 bylaws of the Krakow Jewish community, the Pinkas of Medinat Lita, Shiv Chehabesht in praise of the Baal Shem Tov, and a new scholarly journal, Gal Eid, devoted to the study of Polish Jewry, was established at Tel Aviv University in 1973. New bibliographical work also appeared. In addition to the bibliographical appendices to the encyclopedia articles, there were several important bibliographical essays, too numerous to list now. The most significant, of course, was Hundert and Bacon's book of bibliographical essays, The Jews of Russia and Poland, or excuse me, The Jews in Poland and Russia. Another important development was the first signs of weakening in the monolithic communist regime and the availability of archival material from Eastern European countries, which began trickling mostly in the form of microfilm into uh, the Central Archive for the History of the Jewish People and other archives, uh, some as early as the 1950s. This made it possible for non-communist scholars to begin to entertain the possibility of finding new archival sources. A final component in the new research infrastructure was the publication of several synthetic works, which provided a summary and interpretation of basic material thus helping to define a new research agenda. To give a few examples, Mahler's Jews in Poland between the two world wars, while intended as a polemic to prove the untenability of Jewish existence in interwar Poland, also provided a solid statistical foundation for future historiography of the Jews in independent Poland. A collection of articles published by YIWO, Studies on Polish Jewry, edited by Joshua Fishman, in 1974, provided extensive analyses of a number of essential topics such as anti-Semitism, economic history, assimilation, social welfare, youth movements, and political literature. It also contained a collection of documents. Celia Heller's On the Edge of Destruction, while rather controversial, was the first serious full-length monographic treatment of the inter interwar period as a whole, at once summarizing old knowledge developing the relatively new theme of assimilation and clearly expressing the by then conventional view that the overall pattern of Jewish existence in interwar Poland was impressive cultural creativity in the face of official discrimination and unofficial hatred. Lucian Dobroszycki and Barbara kirschenblatt Gimblet published Image Before My Eyes, A Photographic History of Jewish Life in Poland, 
which presented a more varied, realistic, and representative view of Polish Jewry than had Wyszniak's 1947 Polish Jewry. Around the same time, the Jewry of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth received a thorough reconsideration in wine ribs, the Jews of Poland. And subsequently, Baron's 16th volume of his uh, Social and Religious History of the Jews. These two books, while differing in approach, emphasis, and interpretation, did share characteristics which signaled a new departure in scholarship. First, both insisted on viewing the history of the Jews in Poland as inextricably bound up with Polish history. Unlike earlier writing, in their books, the Polish context was prominently displayed. Second, in comparison with works in Hebrew, these books barely mention the topic of Jewish autonomy. Third, the positive overall tone of their narratives contrasted sharply with the accepted view of Polish Jewish history as fundamentally a tragic story. In addition to new tools and new interests, beginning in the 1970s, there was finally a new cadre of scholars who could take up the mantle of those who had perished in the Shoah. The first of these were Polish Jews who had received their early education in Poland and then migrating mainly to, to Israel shortly before or just after the war, completed their doctoral dissertations in the 1960s and 70s. They were later joined by a number of their generational peers who had remained in Poland after the war, completed their advanced education there, but left for Israel or the West uh, after 1956 or 1968. Shlomo Netzer, Emanuel Meltzer, Moshe Landau wrote detailed, tightly focused monographs on the politics of Jewish existence in Poland during the interwar years, where earlier works had generalized on the basis of examples and selected statistics, these new studies were based on exhaustive primary documentation and statistical analysis and presented a much more nuanced and penetrating portrayal of the subject. Bina Gonsarska Kedari and Sabina Levin opened up new topics, exploring the economic and educational factors in the formation of the various Jewish class groupings and intelligentsia in the 19th century. A new research theme was the reestablishment of Polish Jewry in the post-war years, and here Chana Shlomi and Yisrael Gutman took the lead. There were also new surveys of Poland's Jews in the interwar period. Pavel Kozhets presented his thesis as to the all-pervasiveness of anti-Semitism in determining the Jewish policy and other policies of the Polish state. Joseph Marcus showed how the Jews' actual economic status was more a function of general economic conditions than specific discriminatory policies and asserted to the consternation of most of the reviewers of his book that Jewish political efforts of the type detailed by Netzer, Landau, and Meltzer aimed at securing Jewish civil, political, and minority rights were misguided. Representatives of this group of historians also revisited the pre-partition period. Jakub Goldberg, Mordechai Nadav, Arthur Ziegelmann initiated a broad reinterpretation of the history of the Jews of the Nobles Commonwealth by demonstrating the paramount relevance of Polish archival sources to Polish Jewish history even in the period where Jews were at their most traditional. On the basis of their analyses, the Polish material, uh, uh, on the basis of their analyses of Polish material, the paradigm of symbiosis began to challenge the traditional concept of parallel societies as the most appropriate trope for the Polish Jewish relationship. Both Goldberg and Siegelman published source collections, and Nadav pre prepared an edition of the communal record book of Tikotchen, Tiktin, which all have great potential as teaching and research tools. Another group of scholars, identifiable by its demographic and educational background, is Jews born and educated in Israel. Younger than the previous group, and mainly students of theirs or of their older contemporaries, like Ettinger, Katz, and Halpern, 
for people like Yishai Shachar, Yaakov Elboim, Emanuel Etkis, Yaakov Chisdai, Elchanan Reiner, Zev Gris, Yisrael Bartal, David Asaf, Polish Jewish history was a subset within broader interests, focusing on such subjects as Ashkenazic culture, Hasidism, land of Israel studies, and Haskalah. They came to Polish Jewry primarily via Jewish texts and concentrated on intellectual and religious history and the history of cultural institutions. A third group is composed of people raised or largely educated outside of both Poland and Israel. You know their names. Almost all of them are distinguished by their ability to combine Polish and Jewish sources, their familiarity with trends in Western historiography, and in comparison to the survivors and emigres, their lack of intense emotional attachment to Polish Jewry of the interwar and Shoah periods. With some notable ex exceptions, most of their studies are heavily dependent on archival and quantifiable material. They have significantly furthered the process of articulating a broad new view of Polish Jewry. One feature of this is the attempt to clarify the degree to which the Jews indeed were of Poland and not merely in it. That is inextricably linked to the social, cultural, economic, and even political processes of the country. Hundred, for example, entitled one of the chapters of his book, The Jews in a Private Polish Town, Jews and Other Poles. For these writers, there is no celebrating the heroic achievements of Polish Jewry and even candid admissions of shortcomings. Thus, and uh, I can't believe I have to say the late, Ezra Mendelssohn stated in the Jews of East Central Europe between the wars uh, that he would enumerate the failures of Jewish nationalism, while others have written about Jewish criminality and belligerence without apology. With regard to non-Jews and more specifically anti-Jewish behavior, these writers exhibit a willingness to entertain structural or objective factors of politics, economics, sociology, tradition, etc., in the fom fomenting of persecution. However, they still typically maintain that Gentiles made a choice when they attacked or discriminated against Jews, and that in the decision process, the identity of the victim was not incidental. A fourth group was mainly non-Jewish scholars born and educated within Poland, and to a lesser extent, non-Jews outside of Poland, who began to define within the broad subject of Polish history subjects that centered on the Jewish experience. The reasons for this are connected to the liberalization, new style nationalism, and turn to the West experienced in Poland in the late 1970s and 1980s. Polish historians, searching for the historical roots of a non-communist, liberal, independent, democratic, Polish Poland, found them in the multinational Poland of the past. In the conventional Polish historiography on this commonwealth of many nationalities, the subject of the Jews was the one that was treated the most superficially. Yet, it was precisely this subject that seems still to be an issue for Polish society, mostly because of a residual widespread image of Polish anti-Semitism in the world and lingering mutual recriminations with regard to the fate of the Jews in Poland in the 20th century. Curiosity over this paradox became an opportunity for serious research when the political atmosphere of the 1980s led to the initiation of an unprecedented series of international conferences. Perhaps most significantly, the journal Pauline was founded after the 1986 conference in Oxford. On its pages, for the first time since the war, and in a, in a sense, for the first time ever, Jewish and Polish scholars were engaged in serious academic discourse. As late as 1986, Andrzej Chojnowski could write, quote, the Jewish question is still examined in recent Polish historiography in a most fragmentary manner. By 2015, however, I think it is fair to say that there are probably more scholars and certainly more students in Poland's centers of Jewish studies, in Warsaw, Krakow, and Wrocław, than in the USA, Israel, and the UK combined. There are also both old and new journals devoted exclusively to Jewish studies, the Zich's Bulletin, Studia Judaica, Scripta Judaica Krakowiensia. 
Perhaps the most salient feature of the new, politically unfettered Polish historiography on Polish Jewry is what Adam Teller has termed the reinsertion of the Jews into Polish history. Whereas traditionally, Polish scholars viewed the Jews as marginal, even alien, to Polish history, they are now considered to be an essential element in the narrative of multi-ethnic Poland's historical development. The studies of contemporary Polish scholars explain the Jewish experience as part and parcel of the larger Polish one. The past two generations of Polish Jewish historiography have forged a new master narrative and a new historiographical agenda. There is now broad agreement with Jakub Goldberg's famous observation that has been repeated here many times, where previously scholars seemed to neglect the Polish in Polish Jewish history it seems that the balance has now shifted and Polish Jewry is now often depicted as first and foremost Polish and this museum is a good example. This may even lead to a new reactive emphasis by Jewish scholars at least on what tied Polish Jews to Jewish history outside of Poland. There certainly is room to fully document and analyze the cultural, economic and social connections between Jews in Poland and Jews in Western Ashkenaz. One obvious central theme is patterns and institutions of Torah study in all of Ashkenaz, or the relationship between Polish Jewry and German court Jews. For the interwar period, there is need to realize Ezra Mendelssohn's call for much more comparative study of the circumstances of Jews and other minorities throughout Eastern Europe. With regard to the inter integrative trend, however, for both the pre-partition and later periods, much more can be done on the question of cultural and social relations. The current literature is contradictory as to whether there was meaningful cultural contact between Jews and Gentiles in Poland. When and to what extent did social relations move beyond the utilitarian? Periodization has also been altered, especially with respect to the pre-partition Jewish history. The pre and post 1648 distinction is now much less emphasized. The 18th century is viewed much, as much less crisis filled than previously asserted. And the early modern period of Polish history is now seen as an integral unit usually defined as 16th to 18th uh, century. This period has been heavily studied, in particular the importance of the relationship between Jews and the land-owning aristocratic nobility has been extensively explicated and emphasized. Lately, younger researchers have begun turning towards renewed study of the relationship between royal or state institutions and the Jews. The long overlooked subject of the various churches and the Jews and deeper investigation of social relationships between Jews and Christians. There's also a refreshing new interest in the history of Jews in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania as a subject in its own right, separate from the history of the Jews in Poland. In addition, as we heard from Hanna Zaremska, there is new exploration of the pre-1500 period. There is also new insistence that the history of Polish Jews in the 19th century should no longer be subsumed um, under the rubric of Russian Jewish history. As Marcin Wojcicki and others have demonstrated, there really was a distinctly Polish Jewish community between the partitions and 1918. With regard to autonomy, the reigning sub-theme has been to tone down the romantic Jewish nationalist interpretation of the past. Some of the institutions of Jewish autonomy have come to be seen as more limited in scope and authority and more subservient to Polish institutions than previously thought. What would be useful now is more study of the parallels and points of articulation between Jewish and Polish institutions in order to arrive at a better understanding of the intricacies of the governance of the Jews. With regard to Hasidism, there has been a great deal of attention paid to Israel Baal Shem Tov and the origins of Hasidism. However, the most important trend, in my opinion, has been to target Hasidism of the 19th century and not uh, not see it as the degenerate stage of the movement, but rather as the mature and much more interesting one. 
The struggles of the Jews for rights in the interwar period have been carefully documented and analyzed. At the same time, their efficacy and even the appropriateness of the term struggle has been questioned. The subjectivist versus objectivist view of Polish-Jewish relations and anti-Semitism are engaged in something of a struggle of their own. It is here that the ideological commitments of the historians of the various backgrounds that I described before are most apparent. The older, former Polish school usually saw interwar Poland as a crucible where a secular, left-leaning, new Jewish society and culture were cultivated. Politically, interwar Poland demonstrated the national nature of the Jewish people and proved the need for a nationalist solution to the precariousness of their existence. Today's Polish historians and others tend to view the Jewish problem as one among many and anti-Semitism as an unfortunate byproduct of unavoidable conditions. The younger Sabras and Westerners, whom I mentioned before, many of them committed to a religious outlook, include more sectors of Jewish society in the story. With regard to anti-Semitism, their own experience with pluralist and majority, minority societies inclined them to take the Polish analysis more seriously than their teachers did. Still, for them, anti-Semitism was not merely incidental. In general, the research focus on this period has changed from the secular, nationalist, and leftist groups to previously ignored groups among the orthodox, the political right, and assimilationists. There has also been a turn away from politics towards social life, economics, culture, and religion. In particular, we should probably expect more studies about the weakening of Jewish cultural institutions. To my mind, it would be desirable to pay more attention to the unaffiliated, non-ideological, moderately traditionalist Jews. One can easily get the impression from uh, existing historiography that there were few such people in interwar Poland, and such a counterintuitive conclusion merits examination. The past two generations have witnessed an intense international discussion on the history of the Jews in Poland. It has involved a sizable number of scholars from several countries who engage each other at frequent conferences and on the pages of journals and volumes of collected studies. There are centers for the study of the history and culture of Polish Jewry on three continents. There are graduate students at all of these institutions and others besides, including a biannual joint Polish-Israeli workshop for doctoral candidates. In 1955, Jacob Shotsky, the historian of Warsaw Jewry, despaired. For whom am I slaving? For whom am I writing? And about whom? My people is dead. My subject is dead. And I am dead tired. If only he could have seen this magnificent museum and how it has made his subject come alive. Thank you. Bardzo dziękujemy. Naszym drugim referentem, naszą drugą referentką jest Judith Kalic z Uniwersytetu Hebrajskiego w Jerozolimie. Judith zajmuje się kontaktami, oddziaływaniem ekonomicznym, kulturowym, religijnym między społecznościami chrześcijańską i żydowską. Zajmuje się również zajmuje się również um, źródłami um, o charakterze bardziej masowym. Będzie dzisiaj um, mówić o um, będzie dzisiaj mówić o nowym spojrzeniu na dane ze spisów podatkowych ludności żydowskiej w Koronie w XVIII wieku. Bardzo proszę. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you. In my book entitled Scepter of Judah, Jewish Autonomy in the 18th Century Crown Poland, which was based on an analysis of the assessment lists of the Jewish poll tax in 1717-1764 in Crown Poland, I apprehended what I called rotation schedule of tax assessment. That is, an increase of taxation burden in some communities and simultaneous reduction of this burden in other communities. Since during the discussed period, the Jewish poll tax for Crown Poland was fixed, excuse me, at a permanent sum of 220,000 zlotys, which was about twice lower than the real Jewish population of the country, the Council of Four Lands and the regional councils 
had relatively broad freedom of choice to assign the taxation burden to various communities in rotation. The claim was raised in the course of the further discussion on my conclusions that, sorry, uh, pra uh, that the practice uh, practically that in practice, every individual Jewish taxpayer paid annually the same sum of money, the poll tax being only a fraction of this sum, while the rest covered other expenses of Jewish communities and councils. Thus, the reduction of the poll tax for certain community did not mean that this community paid less, but that the sum reduced from, all, from the poll tax was diverted for other needs. Of course, the poll tax assessment list does not uh, reflect all the expenses of the Jewish communities. But the usual level of the poll tax, regardless the periodical changes and tax exemptions for all communities of Crown Poland combined together would produce what I have called tax potential, which does reflect the actual size, more or less of course, of the Jewish population. One of the ways to solve this controversy is to compare the assessment list presented in my book with the sporadic documentation reflected in, re in uh, relations between the Council of Four Lands with the regional councils and Jewish communities. Thanks to the wonderful work my, made by the late Mordechai Nadav with the minute book of Tikochin Autonomous Major Community, Pinkaski Latiktin, we have a relatively rare opportunity to look into the nearly complete set of documents of one of such regional councils, Autonomous Major Community of Tikochin, functioned in practice as a regional council. In my present lecture, I would like to clarify the picture showing some examples of the hidden mechanism behind the fluctuations of poll tax assessment. The matter is that, as I have said, the assessment lists are systematic records covering the entire Crown Poland, but the pattern of periodical changes in assessment of the poll tax levels, level is reflected also in sporadic Jewish documentation. Let us look at some of these documents. Thus, we find that in 1731, the community of Orly, now Orla, reached an agreement with the major community of Tikochin that the annual poll tax of Orly will be set at 1,350 zlotis, which is, in fact, a sum paid by Orly in 1734 and 1733 and 1734, excuse me, according to the assessment list. However, the agreement includes the following clause, and I quote, but if the poll tax will increase by the assessments of the Council of Four Lands beyond our present estimate, the value of the addition shall be cleared from the assessed expenses of the above holy community on behalf of the Council of Four Lands or to Warsaw, etc. But the holy community of Orly shall be exempted from payment of even one grosh pruta during the validity of this assessment, end of quote. A similar clause in also, is also found in an agreement between the community of Bochki and major community of Tikochin in 1745, which set the poll tax of Bochki at the level of 500 zlotis. But in this case, there is no provision for a clearing and addition from the other expenses, and I quote, but if our poll tax will increase by assessment of the Council of Four Lands beyond our present assessment, the value of assessment shall be according to the addition imposed on this holy community, end of quote. Both cases show clearly that an, ex <coughs> that an unexpected increase uh, of the taxation burden as a result of the reassessment of the Jewish poll tax by the Council of Four Lands was a real possibility, which should be taken into consideration in negotiations between the communities and regional councils. Even more interesting is that some documents provide us with the reasons for tax reduction. Thus, for example, in 1732, the community of Orly, which as we have seen from our first example, had to pay in the following year 1,350 uh, <coughs> zlotis as a poll tax, asked and received a reduction of 200 zlotis as a compensation for the loss of income from rural tavern Sheng, which was attached to another community. 
According to the assessment list, this reduction was implemented only in 1737, when the community of Orly paid indeed 1,050 zlotys as a poll tax, exactly 200 zlotys less than the original assessment. If you can please show my first table. Whoever, oh, you see, all right. It's a little bit more, I can't, be, I can't see it, but I hope it's the right one. This case shows, among other things, that the villages in the rural periphery of the Jewish urban communities were indeed transferred from one community to another because of poll, of poll tax considerations, as I claimed on the basis of the situation in the neighboring Van Groove community, uh, reflected in the uh, assessment list, but without the support till now of any direct evidence. In 1756, the agreement between the same community of Orly and major community of Tekochin set the poll tax of Orly at the level of 1,100 zlotys for the next four years. But Orly received a reduction of 100 zlotys for the purpose of repairing of their synagogue, which was split into three equal installments of 33 zlotys during three years. In practice, we know from the assessment list that Orly paid 1,100 zlotys continuously from 1742 to 1764. Please show the, the next um, table. During this period of time, this sum increased in 1743 to 1,200 zlotys and was reduced twice to 900 zlotys and, uh, in 1749 and to uh, 1,066 zlotys in 1759. The last reduction obviously corresponds to the reduction of repair of the synagogue agreed upon in 1756, but contrary to agreement, this reduction was valid for one year only. The reference to other expenses of the Jewish communities mentioned in our first example is significant, since they could be used for coverage of poll tax and vice versa. As Adam Kazmierczyk remarked in his review of my book, in 1744, the Regional Council of Ordinacja Zamoyska and Wolin agreed that the Council of Ordinacja Zamoyska will pay a debt of Wolin for, uh, to Father Maciej Pawłowicz the Dean of Zamość in a sum of 8,000 zlotys, and the Council of Wolen in return will pay the poll tax of Ordinacja Zamoyska. I am very grateful to Adam for this wonderful example, which shows clearly the direct connection between the assessment lists and the sporadic documents. According to the assessment list, the poll tax of Ordinacja Zamoyska was indeed reduced in 1744, from 9,640 zlotys to 920 zlotys. Please show the next table. An increase of the poll tax assessment for Wolin in 1744 was much more modest. It raised from 28,399 zlotys to 30,150 zlotys. But Wolin was a very large regional council and it had broad space for distribution of the tax burden between its constitution, constituent, constituent major excuse me, communities in order to diminish an overall tax increase on Wallen as a whole. This is exactly what I have called rotation schedule in my book, a term which was sometimes misunderstood. Some communities were totally exempt from taxation, permanently or temporarily. The reason for these exemptions also can be found in some sporadic documents. The community of Lublin, for example, was tax exempt in 1739 on account of its expenses in the sum of 1,400 zlotys for the maintenance of the rabbinic high court in Lublin. We find in the assessment list that indeed the community of the city of Lublin proper, called Lublin Synagogue, was tax exempt in 1739. But the two sub uh, suburbs of Lublin, Kalinowszczyzna and Krakowskie Przedmieście, paid together 1,450 zlotys as a poll tax for this year. Please show the final table. Which means that the taxation burden was simply, simply transferred from Lublin proper to the suburban communities. Now, does all this mean that the assessment lists are irrelevant for the reconstruction of the demography of the Jewish population in Crown Poland? The answer is, no. 
the continuous and systematic records uh, uh, in a, uninterrupted for nearly half a century enable us to apprehend the tax potential for every community, regardless of the periodical tax reductions and exemptions. This hypothetic tax potential stands uh, consistently, I'm sorry, at 17.5% above the figures of the census of 1764. This observation demonstrates the advantages and shortcomings of systematic and sporadic records. Systematic records, assessment list in our case, provide overall picture of continuous fluctuations in poll tax figures, but do not disclose the reasons uh, uh, standing behind every reduction on increase in taxation burden or tax exemptions. While the sporadic documents reveal these reasons, but do not show their long-term context and significance. Quite naturally, both groups of sources complement each other. We have seen that every change in the poll tax assessment for every community had some hidden reason standing behind it. I did not deal with these reasons in my book, which the sole, uh, with the sole uh, exception of the case of Vyshbovitz in Podolia, which poll tax was reduced in 1761 by half, um, uh, because of the destruction caused by Heidemax, which is indicated in the assessment list itself. Some of these reasons are surely indicated in numerous other documents related to the Council of Four Lands. The solid basis of uh, uh, published sources col source collections already exists for the search after such documents. These are, first of all, the major collection of Hebrew documents uh, gathered by uh, Israel Halperin, Pinkas Va Dale Daratzot, and the recently published by my late teacher, Jakob Goldberg, and Iva Dele Chaim Arukim, as we say in Hebrew, Adam Kazmierczyk, collection of Polish documents, same Czterech Zem, Zrudla. And the expected second part of the collection of Hebrew documents is currently under preparation by Israel Bartal. Numerous letters attached to the assessment list in the uh, files of the military treasury remain so far under, uh, unused. I began to work with these letters and 17th century documents only now in the framework of a new research project of Hebrew University sponsored by the Israeli Academy of Science, uh, concluded by Israel Bartal and myself in cooperation with me. The period before the fiscal reform of 1717 is also of great interest. Since 17th century documents contain tax assignments, assignati, for every taxation unit with references to other communal expenses written often in Hebrew on the margins of the same sheet of paper by several persons. This combination of tax assessment with detailed account of the reasons for its level in one document reveals the full uh, specter of financial considerations standing behind the fiscal policy of the Council of Four Lands. Please show the, I prepared the, just one example to, so you can see these wonderful documents. You see, and this is many people writing, yes, not one handwriting. And the next one, please. Here you can see the Polish text and surrounding all the Hebrew uh, text. Dear colleagues, the search for such sporadic documents with explanations of the oddities of the Jewish poll tax assessment in other archival collections seems to me a very promising and challenging director, direction of research, which I would like to offer for your consideration. I believe that only such combination of systematic and sporadic records would, ma would make it possible to produce, at last, a synthetic study of the Council of Four Lands, which is presently still lacking. Thank you. Bardzo dziękujemy. Nasz um, trzeci referent, Jan Doktor z Żydowskiego Instytutu Historycznego, um, redaktor um, naczelny kwartalnika historii Żydów, zajmuje się um, mesjanizmem, zajmuje się frankizmem, hasydyzmem, a także misjami chrześcijańskimi um, um, wobec Żydów w XVIII wieku. Jego dzisiejsze wystąpienie zatytułowane jest Frankizm, historia Jakuba Franka czy frankistów? Bardzo proszę. <śmiech> Dziękuję bardzo. Historia frankizmu przedstawiana jest zazwyczaj 
jako historia charyzmatycznego mesjańskiego uzurpatora i jego stronników. Miała się ona zacząć wraz z jego przybyciem w grudniu 1755 roku do Rzeczpospolitej i przyłapaniem go wraz z innymi mesjanistami żydowskimi podczas jakiejś sekciarskiej celebry. Takie ujęcie frankizmu do pewnego stopnia tłumaczy stan źródeł skoncentrowanych, niemal zafiksowanych na charyzmatycznej postaci Franka. Jego sekciarscy towarzysze i rywale praktycznie znikli z kart historii. Niewątpliwie wydarzenia 27 stycznia 1756 roku w Lanskoroniu koło Kamieńca Podolskiego, gdy mesjańscy sekciarze demonstracyjnie zamanifestowali swoją sabatajstyczną wiarę, można uznać za akt założycielski ruchu, zwanego później frankistowskim. Ujawnieni sekciarze zostali pobici przez zebranych na jarmarku Żydów, zadenuncjowani u miejscowych władz i aresztowani. Uruchomiło to spiralę wydarzeń, które kulminowały w dwóch publicznych dysputach z rabinami i wejściu sekciarzy do kościoła rzymskokatolickiego. Wyjaśnienia wymagają jednak trzy kwestie. Pierwsza, w jakim celu przyjechał Jakub Frank do Rzeczpospolitej? Drugie, drugie czy wydarzenia w Lanskoroniu były przypadkowym zajściem, które spowodowały nieoczekiwane przez nikogo abrzemienne w skutki konsekwencje, czy też była to zaplanowana wcześniej demonstracja, by nie rzecz prowokacja? Trzecie, czy w zajściach brali udział tylko polscy Żydzi, czy też także Żydzi z innych krajów? Wyklarowanie obrazu początków ruchu frankistowskiego pomoże nam w znalezieniu odpowiedzi na pytanie, jaka była faktycznie rola Franka w tym ruchu, w jakiej mierze Frank był jego faktycznym przywódcą, a w jakiej wykreowaną i zmitologizowaną postacią założyciela, jak choćby współczesnym ubalszem to w sasydyzmie. Jakow Józef ben Leib, Leib, zwany Frankiem, a później Frankiem, urodził się na Podolu, ale wyjechał z rodzicami na Włoszczyznę, gdy miał zaledwie rok. Uważał się za Syfardyjczyka, nie znał Jidysz i, jak sam przyznawał, z Polską i polskimi Żydami nie czuł się związany. Aż do jesieni 1755 roku nic nie, zapowiada, nie zapowiadało jego mesjańskiego posłanictwa w Polsce. Okoliczności jego przyjazdu do Rzeczpospolitej i jego wydalenia kilka tygodni później należą w dziejach frankizmu do najważniejszych i najbardziej zagadkowych. Przebieg dalszych wydarzeń każe przypuszczać, że Frank przybył z towarzyszami, by wziąć udział w planowanej przez podolskich sekciarzy, najwidoczniej w porozumieniu z tamtejszą hierarchią kościelną, demonstracji. Po przyjeździe do Polski wołoscy sekciarze, a za, takiego, za takowego był uważany także Frank, udali się do Lwowa na rozmowy z duchowieństwem. Frank zamieszkał w podlwowskiej niemieckiej osadzie Dawidów, a w tym czasie Nachman ben Szmuel z Buska prowadził w jego imieniu jakieś rozmowy w kurii arcybiskupiej, których tematu i przebiegu nie znamy. Sam Frank nie został w kurii przyjęty. Gdyby wiedział, że tak się stanie, zapewne nie pchałby się taki szmat drogi do Lwowa, tylko od razu posłał tam swego załóżnika ale widać jakieś nadzieje w tym względzie miał. Źródła kościelne ten epizod całkowicie pomijają. Łatwo się domyśleć, że Kościół po prostu nie zgodził się na udział cudzoziemców z Frankiem na czele w rozpoczynających się działaniach. Otwartym pozostaje pytanie, jak odnosili się do nich podolscy sekciarze i czy mieli na oku te same cele. Pewne jest tylko, że stosunek miejscowych do przybyszy był, delikatnie mówiąc, daleki od entuzjazmu. Frank postawił wszystko na jedną kartę i postanowił na własną rękę włączyć się z bałkańskimi towarzyszami do gry, licząc zapewne, że pozostali uczestnicy postawieni wobec faktów dokonanych zaakceptują ich udział. 
27 stycznia przyjechali do Lans Koronia, gdzie było już zebranych około 20 podolskich sekciarzy. To, co wydarzyło się w Lanskoronskiej karczmie, ma dla naszych rozważań, a także dla dalszego biegu wypadków, drugorzędne znaczenie. Według źródeł kościelnych zebrani mieli śpiewać mistyczne pieśni, wedle źródeł frankistowskich śpiewać i tańczyć, a wedle podań żydowskich zostali przyłapani na orgiastycznej ceremonii, w której miała brać udział jakaś naga kobieta, której nie było jednak wśród zatrzymanych osób. Wszyscy przebywający w karczmie zostali aresztowani przez zarządcę miasta, ale po trzech dniach cudzoziemcy z Frankiem na czele zostali ku swemu zaskoczeniu uwolnieni i wydaleni z Rzeczpospolitej. Najprawdopodobniej po prostu odwieziono ich za granicę do Chocimia, gdzie stacjonował turecki garnizon. Nie byli zatem przesłuchiwani w kamienickim konsystorzu, dokąd sprowadzono pozostałych aresztantów, ani też nie ma ich wśród sygnatariuszy manifestu sekciarzy poprzedzającego ich dysputę z Raminami w roku 1757. Wprawdzie Frank powrócił jeszcze w kwietniu tego roku do Rzeczpospolitej, ale niemal natychmiast został ponownie aresztowany i tym razem definitywnie wydalony. Dalszą wyjechał więc do Turcji, gdzie przeszedł z grupą stronników na islam. Dalszą grę prowadzili wyłącznie polscy sekciarze, którzy nie rozpaczali zbytnio po jego wyjeździe. Śmierć biskupa Dębowskiego, prowadzącego z ramienia kościoła sprawę sekciarzy żydowskich, otworzyła przed Frankiem nową szansę misji w Polsce. W 1758 roku Udało mu się przekonać do siebie nowego arcybiskupa lwowskiego i przyszłego prymasa Konstancego Władysława Łubińskiego. Co ciekawe, udało mu się to już jako muzułmanowi, gdy pełnił ze swoimi stronnikami służbę w tureckim garnizonie w Biurgiu nad Dunajem. Co więcej, ten banica, a obecnie muzułmanin, został wraz ze swoimi stronnikami muzułmanami zaproszony do Rzeczpospolitej i przez wiele miesięcy mieszkał w dobrach biskupa Kamienieckiego. Ale wątpliwe, czy zdobył wśród polskich sekciarzy przywódczą pozycję. Wiele wskazuje na to, że skupiła się wokół niego tylko ich część i to zdecydowanie mniejsza. Niemniej to on wyszedł z zaskakującą nową inicjatywą, wyznaczył kierunek i narzucił tempo mesjańskiego marszu. To Frank ze swoimi bałkańskimi stronnikami zainicjował drugą dysputę publiczną z rabinami. Tym razem dysputa miała mieć wymiar ponadpaństwowy. Stosowną suplikę do prymasa Łubieńskiego wystosowali sekciarze żydowscy z Węgier i Wołoszczyzny. Ich delegacja udała się na rozmowy do Lwowa, gdzie 20 lutego złożyła w konsystorzu stosowną suplikę. Deklarowali w niej w imieniu Żydów, cytuję, polskich, węgierskich, tureckich, multańskich, wołoskich i innych, koniec cytatu, gotowość chrztu w kościele rzymskokatolickim i prosili o zorganizowanie następnej publicznej debaty z rabinami, w której chcą podnieść kwestię mordu rytualnego. Warto podkreślić, że wśród sygnatariuszy nie było żadnego polskiego Żyda, ani też samego Franka. Polscy sekciarze byli początkowo tej inicjatywie niechętni. Zostali jednak najpierw przez Franka, a później przez hierarchię, która nadała tej inicjatywie wielki rozgłos, zaskoczeni i gdy zagraniczni inicjatorzy się wycofali, musieli ją kontynuować lekko zmodyfikowaną sami. Sam zaś Frank inicjatywą tą wykreował się przynajmniej w oczach Kościoła i pierwszych dziejopisów frankistów, frankizmu na przywódcę. Jego przywódczej roli nie podważali publicznie także sekciarze niechętni mu, na czele których stali bracia Jehuda i Eliasz Krysowie. To oni bowiem przewodzili sek sekciarzom na pierwszej dyspudzie w Kamieńcu Podolskim. Można to zrozumieć. W tym momencie najważniejsza była jedność sekciarzy, bowiem tylko działając razem mogli coś w negocjacjach z Kościołem ugrać, 
albo przynajmniej im się tak to wydawało. Mesjańska maskarada skończyła się jednak szybko. Osadzenie Franka w klasztorze jasnogórskim na początku 1760 odsłoniło faktyczne poparcie dla niego. Pozostała przy nim zaledwie garstka oddanych stronników, nazywana szumnie kompanią. W starszych rękopisach machną. Okazało się, że nałożone początkowo ograniczenia kontaktów z innymi neofitami nie są potrzebne i zostało szybko zniesione. Pojawił się natomiast problem utrzymania Franka, jego rodziny i kilkunastu rodzin pozostających przy nim stronników. Koszty te łaskawie wziął na siebie biskup krakowski Kajetan Sołtys. Przez kolejnych dwadzieścia kilka lat podczas pobytu na Jasnej Górze, a później na wygnaniu w Mnie Murawskim, Frankowi towarzyszyła tylko garstka neofitów. Nie znamy okoliczności, w jakich Frankowi udało się zdobyć rząd dusz pozostałych neofitów, ale wiemy, że stało się to w latach 1783-84. Być może ten przełom ozna oznajmiają dziwne słowa redaktora słów pańskich. Cytuję. W roku 1783 zaczęły się ostatnie dni. W 1784 roku Frank wypomniał skruszonym sekciarzom przybyłym do Brna. Cytuję. 25 lat byliście zawikłani. Poszliście za człowiekiem, co nie ma pomocy i czyniliście brzydkie czynności. A za półtora roku oczyszczę was od wszechnieczystości. W tym samym roku Frank zarządził, że trzy razy do roku powinien się każdy mężczyzna pokazać. W domyśle u niego. W skromnym domu w Brnie nie mógł jednak, nie zwracając uwagi policji, przyjmować większych grup polskich neofitów, to też natychmiast zaczęto szukać nowego miejsca na rezydencję, w której Frank mógłby założyć dwór stosowny do nowych potrzeb. Miejsce takie znalazł w końcu w obustoszałym zamku księcia Izenburgskiego, Wolfganga Ernsta w Offenbachu, gdzie po odremontowaniu spędził ostatnie lata życia otoczony tłumami stronników, przybywających głównie Rzeczpospolitej. O jego dworze w Zamku Książęcym rozpisywały się gazety zarówno polskie, jak i niemieckie. Obraz charyzmatycznego patriarchy neofitów i jego dworu w Offenbachu był później przez historyków i publicystów ekstrapolowany na wcześniejsze i późniejsze dzieje ruchu, o których wiemy, musimy to szczerze przyznać, niewiele. Szczególnie odnosi się to do dworu jego córki Ewy, która pozostała w Offenbachu po śmierci Franka jeszcze przez 25 lat i wykreowała, została przez historyków na przywódce sekty. Pomocne były w tym, Dokumenty, które w zadziwiających okolicznościach pojawiały się wiele dziesięcioleci po jej śmierci i znikały zaraz po ich opublikowaniu. Nie będę tutaj, ja w innym miejscu je opublikowałem i omówiłem. Fakt, że po śmierci Franka dwóch ofenbarski opustoszał i że Frank Ewa przejęła, nie przejęła mesjańskiej sukcesji po ojcu nie znaczy, by w 1791 roku dzieje frankizmu się skończyły. Biegły dalej, tyle że już bez Franka. Nadal czekają one na zbadanie, podobnie jak źródła, które mam nadzieję, na źródła, mam nadzieję, bardziej wiarygodne niż te, które omówiłem w innym miejscu, które też mam taką nadzieję, nadal czekają schowane gdzieś na historyka. Dziękuję. Bardzo dziękujemy. Wybaczcie Państwo lakoniczność, ale goni nas, goni nas czas. Zostało nam 15 minut do końca tej sesji. Poprosiłabym o pytania, uwagi, komentarze, też w miarę zwięzłe, jeśli można. Państwo z mikrofonami są po obu stronach sali. Thank you. I have a question for Moshe Rossman. You organized your survey of the historiography largely around the biographies or the origins of the historians. That's how you created meaningful interpretive communities. I'm wondering if you'd care to reflect on whether 
in today's world with people uh, cross-pollinating in their graduate studies, uh, in their research, and indeed where they live, whether those distinctions, in your opinion, will remain as decisive as you seem to characterize them for the last 40 years or so. Thank you. Bardzo proszę. Może kilka pytań, tak jak poprzednio, zbierzmy Dobrze, i ja chciałbym, Państwo Czy mogę? E, chciałbym zwrócić uwagę na, znaczy do referatu pani doktor Kali, to znaczy jeżeli chodzi o wartość dyspartymentów i do określenia rzeczywiście liczebności ludności żydowskiej, e, pani doktor zwróciła uwagę na sporadyczne dokumenty inne dokumenty. Ja bym użył raczej, że nie należy mówić o sporadycznych, bo rzeczywiście ich znacznie więcej, tylko raczej o bardzo rozproszone. Wiele z tych dokumentów dopiero pozwoliłoby naprawdę zweryfikować wartość dyspartymentów pogłównego dla dziejów rozsiedle, osadnictwa żydowskiego. Jeżeli, zwłaszcza w XVIII wieku, kiedy większość Żydów, jeżeli analizujemy na przykład strukturę samorządu żydowskiego i rolę pomiędzy głównymi a pomniejszymi, to trzeba także zwracać uwagę na własność magnacką, na, nawet na fakcje magnackie, które po, pozwalają zrozumieć dopiero, dlaczego na przykład powstaje niezależna gmina, dlaczego dochodzi do konfliktu pomiędzy dawniej główną gminą w danym okręgu, a pomniejszą gminą. Dziękuję. Proszę. Mam Marcin Wodziński. Mam pytanie do Moszy Rosmana, a właściwie prośby o komentarz, o dodanie cieni do tego świetlanego obrazu rozwoju studiów polsko-żydowskich w ostatnich 30 latach, gdzie największe braki, zaniedbania się pojawiają, szczególnie w kontekście muzeum, w którym siedzimy. W jakim sensie to miało wpływ na, na konstrukcję tej narracji? A do Janka Doktora mam pytanie w kontekście tytuł tej sesji, która mówi o współczesnym stanie wiedzy i obszarach wymagających dalszych badań, bo ostatecznie nie zrozumiałem, czy sugerujesz, że franki, frankiści to jest temat zaniedbany w, w polsko-żydowskiej historiografii, co dla mnie jest zaskakujące, szczególnie w kontekście tego pierwszego w świecie kościoła pod wezwaniem Jakuba Franka, który mamy tu w muzeum, tak, został wyniesiony na ołtarze jakby ktoś nie widział w galerii XVIII wieku. Wydaje mi się, że jest to jeden z obszarów lepiej zbadanych, w, krótko mówiąc, w historii polskich Żydów wieku XVIII. Stąd moje pytanie o to, żebyś się odniósł do, do stanu badań. Dziękuję. Bardzo dziękuję. Może państwo referujący teraz odniosą się, a może uda nam się jeszcze jedną turę pytań potem zebrać. Bardzo proszę, może. So first to Ben Nathan's question, uh, the answer is no. And uh, the many people in this room, uh, even at this table, don't fit into my paradigm because of what you, what you alluded to. Uh, certainly over the last uh, 10 to 20 years, things have, have changed very much as opposed to what was going on in the 70s, 80s, and even early 90s. So it would be very hard to continue this kind of analysis uh, now. So uh, you're correct. And as far as marching is concerned, I'm not sure exactly which shadows you're referring to, but it won't surprise you if I say that I think meta-history, well, let's put it this way, history is infinite. Meta-history is what determines which parts of history we choose to represent. And as meta-history changes, so the parts of history that we represent will change. And uh, I think i always uh, bother Barbara with what I call the Beirat Futsot problem. Uh, when Beirat Futsot opened in 1978, I think it was, uh, for the first 10 years or so, it was the hottest ticket in Israel. Uh, two places where everybody went, tourists went, was the Kotel and Beirat Futsot. Uh, the next 10 years, it was a place for uh, Uh, school groups, army groups, uh, people who had to go there. And then uh, the, the next 10 years, it was basically boring and irrelevant. Uh, and they've been trying to, to change that now. And 
this museum, as we see, is now the hottest ticket in town. It reflects uh, a certain meta history that many, many people are partners in. What's going to happen 20 years from now, 30 years from now? Uh, well, I hope that it will be able to avoid the Beirat Futsal problem somehow. Um, yeah, uh, Adam, uh, I disagree with you completely. Systematic sources and what I call sporadic sources are total, give us totally different information. Even if we have most of documents uh, are sporadic documents, of course they are. They, and even if we have thousands of them, they won't give us the information that can uh, be given uh, from a systematic uh, uh, records. Only the combination of the two kinds can give us some synthetic uh, Poglon, yes. So uh, um, I think we should uh, search for such documents, and uh, many of them are still unpublished and unused. For example, this Hebrew, uh, Polish, and Hebrew combined documents from the 17th century, which I have found in the archives, there are approximately with, uh, there are several hundreds of such documents concerning the VAD, which no one knows about or used. And uh, they are totally different from the, um, the poll tax uh, lists from the, after the reform of 1717. And uh, only with Hebrew uh, inscriptions on them, there you have approximately, approximately 100 such documents, which are totally unused now. So only when we have all of that, we can speak about you know, some synthetic picture combining all these sources together. Ja odpowiem na pytanie o obraz frankizmu. Rzeczywiście patrzymy na obraz historii polskich Żydów w Polsce, to w ogóle tam nie ma białych plam. Jakiś tam obraz zawsze mamy, kwestia jego jakości. I rzeczywiście, jeżeli chodzi o publikacje na temat frankizmu, to w latach 1758-1761 ukazało się dziewięć książek w języku polskim na ten temat, łącznie z pełną dokumentacją obu dysput. Trudno sobie, ja nie znam drugiego w, takiego wydarzenia politycznego w dziejach I Rzeczpospolitej, które po, po, doczekałaby się takiej lawiny publikacji, bo do tego dochodzą dziesiątki publikowanych listów. Także ja sam pisałem doktorat, zaczynałem karierę naukową od frankizmu, natomiast mówię kwestia jakości. Czy to, były, czy to są źródła historyczne, czy to są fałszywki, pamflety, w każdym razie ja doszedłem do wniosku, że to, co sam napisałem w mojej pracy habilitacyjnej, doktoracie na ten temat, wymaga całkowitej rewizji, dlatego jeszcze raz się na tym zatrzymałem. I to, co tutaj powiedziałem, to nie jest to powtórzenie obrazu, który się spotyka w literaturze po prostu, że kwestionuje ten obraz i rzeczywiście to, może to jest przypadek skrajny, ale Myślę, że to wszystkich historyków czeka, że po prostu konieczność jeszcze ponownego przemyślenia pewnych źródeł, konfrontacji, zadania pewnych podstawowych pytań, czy my, czy nie, nie tylko, czy nie znamy nowych źródeł, ale też, czy właściwie odczytujemy w jakim kontekście stale. To jest jakby, no ja się zająłem, dlatego że ja opublikowałem. Ja czuję się odpowiedzialny za ten obraz frankizmu i tylko dlatego. Dziękuję bardzo. Bardzo dziękuję. Czy ktoś z Państwa jeszcze chciałby zadać pytanie, coś skomentować? Yeah, thank you. Um, a comment um, really bouncing off what Professor Rossman said, and we've heard it twice or three times today, is the idea of the East-West connection, that we expect Polish Jews and Central European Jews somehow to be in connection. I might sense from the sources that it, well, it wasn't like that. In, in rabbinic culture, there was a certain amount of flexibility moving across the borders. But if you analyze the economic structures and the sort of more popular cultural structures, it seems to me that there's quite a strong dividing wall between East and West, and that we really need to understand that if we want to start talking about the connections. But to assume that there's some kind of Ashkenazic realm in which people move backwards and forwards, I think, I think it's more complicated than that. Uh, to, prof to Dr. Kalik, I have a question. Um, I was very struck when I read the book and hearing you again today, the idea of a hidden, the hidden rotation. Now, I can understand why that would be hidden from the Polish authorities, but why didn't it appear in, in, in the Jewish sources? Why is it not discussed there? 
and to Dr. Doctor, um, I was extremely taken with your idea of distinguishing between the Frankists and the Podolian Sabathians, which I think is a, a very fruitful thing. I wonder what are the sources we have to reconstruct the separate ideology of the Sabathians in, in Podolia? Thank you. Bardzo proszę, ktoś jeszcze z Państwu? Chyba już nie. Bardzo proszę w takim razie referentów. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I think it's not a question of assumption. I think that there are certainly uh, economic ties that you can point to between East and West. Secondly, uh, cultural ties, when you, you read the admittedly uh, slim but still existent autobiographical literature that we have, uh, what strikes me is how political boundaries are uh, almost non-existent are, are certainly not uh, of primary importance when people are traveling from place to place. So that implies a certain uh, cultural connections as well. Uh, but like I say, I think it's, <laughs> it's something that has to be researched and, has, and really has not been researched very well. Adam, I can't see where are you, but... <laughs> ah, hello. <laughs> Uh, I think the rotation is reflected in the Hebrew sources, not in so many words, but when Orly negotiated or we with the Tikotchen, you know, with Tiktin, uh, they have in the back of their mind the notion that it is possible to receive this, uh, you know, reduction in tax because they know that there is a system of rotation. So I think it is reflected, this rotation is reflected in this way, in the, these negotiations that is, are reflected in Hebrew sources. Jeżeli chodzi o źródła, na podstawie których można wprowadzić rozróżnienie pomiędzy opcją Franka i opcją polskich sekciarzy, wyznawców Sabataja Cwi, to, tych, to podstawa jest oczywiście dostępna już w publikowanych źródłach, tylko inaczej odczytanych. To ja tutaj trudno mi przywołać fragmenty. Ja rozumiem, że materiał będzie opublikowany przez Muzeum Historii Żydów i tam są stosowne odnośniki. Natomiast materiałów tego jest dosyć i są one dosyć jednoznaczne, pokazujące paralelność walki czy mesjańskiego ruchu Franka i jego stronników, a także polskich sekciarzy, którzy mieli zupełnie przez pierwsze lata inne cele na oku, także w grze z hierarchią kościelną. Dziękuję. Bardzo dziękuję. Bardzo dziękuję Państwu referentom. Bardzo dziękuję Państwu za udział. Udało nam się w tym ciasnym limicie czasowym zmieścić. Zgodnie z programem kończymy. Jest godzina 12.30. Godzinna przerwa obiadowa dalej jest przewidziana. Bardzo dziękuję.